Okay, Samuel also is just joined. So I think we, we are there. All right. So let's get started, guys. Um, so when we kind of wrapped up on Sunday, uh, one of the things that we said that we need to uh, start working on it is to review the requirements document and the design document and um, start going through what I call it's a 3C and a T uh, testing uh, checks against the document. So let's go and start um, when we go section by section. So um, Herschel, if you can just like you know, bring it sure. down. Um, so Dilip, I think I, I sent them a video as well. Most of them should have gone through the video. Okay. Um, so video about review of the document? Review or? of the documents, yep. Okay. So where I want to go, Herschel, is let's go section by section and okay. let's open up the room for any question that anybody have it um, that well, we can get into deeper detail. Sure. So um, I think it's the first section is kind of pretty much high level business description. So if you can scroll it down to, I believe it's page three. Right. So we already kind of like it's in detail in the classroom did talk about the overview and a problem statement. So let's start from um, the next page. Uh, with the assumption and constraint. Is, is there any questions or is there anything that I can help you to get a little bit more understanding of what those means are? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. And uh, uh, if you have any question, because this is more of an interactive, okay? So if you have any question on this specific page or assumption and user constraint, uh, we can talk about it a little bit further. Looks like this is clear to everybody, Herschel. Then let's move okay. to the um, next section, which is, um, does everybody know what Azure hosting platform is? No, can you please explain? Okay, so is everybody familiar with the, something called as Amazon Web Service or uh, Apple iCloud? Yes. Okay. So think about it. Apple iCloud is where all of your data is going to get stored, which is not on your phone. Essentially, it's nothing but a hosting platform where all of the information or even the processing applications are stored. Windows Azure is Microsoft's cloud where you essentially host the application and access from it. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm not able to find the page in the file. So Harshal is on section 1.2 of the requirements document. So if you open it up the requirements document and go to page number 10 in the PDF that he has sent it, that's where he is. Oh, okay. Oh, I was thinking uh, like which file you gave on the day. So if you're looking into the physical copy, mm -hmm. then it is on the first fold, uh, first uh, document under the second tab, and we are on page number four. Okay, thank you. Now let's go to the context diagram, Rachel. I think it's that's the next segment. So let, let me open a forum to the class and say, did everybody understand what this diagram talks about? Yes. Okay, can somebody explain me what it means? Like it's, what are the arrows going out and what is the arrows going in for each one of the boxes? Um, can I explain? Sure. So, yeah, uh, uh, so basically, uh, this diagram tells us about like how the system is interacting with the users. Like there are two users here, dealers uh, and shops. 
uh, the second one is lenders. So it's all about like how the system is interactive with dealers and the lenders. Okay, so, that's good. So uh, Neeti, can you tell me, based on the description that we have looked into the class, remember like the business description of mm -hmm. the problem? Mm -hmm. If I have to put this interaction in a sequential order in by the, that what I mean is which one will happen first, which one will happen second, which one will happen third, can you put in those things on this diagram? Yes. Uh, so the first step would be the payment calculation. Uh, dealer would send them, uh, would uh, calculate the payment. And the second would be uh, like, uh, according to that calculated amount, uh, he would said, uh, submit the credit application. Uh, to, uh, I think, Nithi, your um, voice is getting cut off. And, oh, uh, is it okay now? Yeah, yeah. now it's better. So uh, do I need to start uh, like- No, go ahead and second okay. after the submit credit application, we could hear till then. So after the uh, after application submit submission, it would, uh, the lender would decide like, uh, it would approve it or just reject it. And uh it would go through again afloan.com and it would uh, and dealer would get the notification about the credit application and uh, the last would be a loan review reports. Okay, so that's good, uh, Niti. So uh, for everybody else, what it means it is a context diagram usually helps you to understand interaction of the various users with the system. And if it is in a transactional, which is like in this case, it's a transactional in nature, it will help you to understand which transaction or which segment of transaction happens after which one, right? So you will, as a dealer, um, when a customer comes in to fix a car and they say, I don't have a money, what they will do it is first, they will just try to do a payment calculation to give them an estimate. Hey, this is how much monthly payment it will come. And if they agree to it, they will go ahead and create a credit application and submit it, which will trigger the notification going to the lenders who in turn will review the application and make a determination whether it's gonna be approved or rejected. And then they will enter that decision in the system, which will trigger the notification going back to the dealers. So that kind of completes the entire cycle of the transaction. So then loan review report will be the last. Right, loan review report will be kind of sort of outside the bound of the transaction. It's essentially every so often uh, the dealer may want to like just pull up the reports to say, hey, how much request we submitted this month? How many got approved it? How many got completed? Those kind of things. And the same reports can be then pulled it also by um, the Rflown agents and the area managers who are like, it's kind of um, identifying the reports to uh, look into it, how effectively the platform is getting utilized in which dealers and lenders are act more actively using platform compared to the others. Okay. Right, so I shall, if we can move to the next okay. segment. So now this particular diagram essentially gives a different view of the system. The first one context diagram gave you a transactional view. This one is gives you a functional view. So, so, in, other words, so in this diagram, the only thing I didn't understand is manage users. Who is manage user? Manage dealer, manage lender, and who is the user? So think about it in any system, right? When you look at it, the, the r flown reps are signing up the dealers, right? So they are managing the dealers. Um, they are also managing the lenders. However, if you think about it, if I'm a dealer XYZ and I have 10 different employees working at my location, I need to manage their user accounts. Same thing for how many agents are there in the r flown systems who are eligible to go and sign up the dealers or sign up the lenders. 
somebody has to manage all those users and all those uh, accounts. So those are the managed users. So if you think about it, managed dealers is enabling you to manage all the dealerships. Managed lender enables you to manage all the various lenders who are in the system. But the people who may work at those things are essentially anything but a users of the system. So somebody will be able to manage that users. However, I need that functionality from the system so that I can create a new user. So if I give an example, right? If there is a new employee comes at the dealership and if they need to have an account into the system, the dealer should be able to go in and then create that user for themselves. Does that help you, Sheila? Yes, thank you. So uh, in this case, uh, the system administrator will manage the users? No, so if you look at the later in the document, it talks about who can access what functions and who can perform what functionality. Mm -hmm. okay. So it doesn't have to be system administrator all the time. It could be other users or the other accounts with specific privileges can do that. Okay. Uh, and I have one more question related to this page only. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, there, are, uh, one functionality of offroom.com is approve and reject credit application. So uh, can't we put under this, the managed dealers? So, so think of it, right? It, what this diagram shows you is how the different functions or features are broken down into the system. Okay. So it's not necessarily who can do what, it's more what are the different functions that are part of this system. Okay. So for example, in the Amazon example that we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. there, there is various functionality that happens on that, right? So one functionality would be an inventory management, right? So when you order something from Amazon, whether it's in the stock or not, what determines, right? So Amazon will manage the inventory and based on that, you will be able to see it, whether can I order it now or it's the item is back ordered. Mm -hmm. Another function would be is um, managing the payment methods for a customer. Okay. Another would be is managing uh, customer's order. Yeah. So depending on what functionality you want to do it, your system is going to broken down into multiple, what we call it is a functional component. And this particular diagram shows the view of how our flown is functionally broken down into multiple functions. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else uh, has any question, need clarification? Now, th th these are some of the things you will typically see in the, in the real requirements documents, okay? So you need to be able to look at these diagrams and try to understand what they are trying, uh, what features and functionalities they are trying to build within the system so that you can test it um, and do the other activities as a QA from that standpoint. It's basically giving you idea about how systems supposed to work end to end. That's that's what the requirement diagram. Uh, I mean, some of the diagrams uh, are telling you that information, that level of information. Okay, moving on. Let's continue. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So any questions around the business processes? Did everybody understand what this section talks about? I'm gonna take silence as a golden. That means everybody understands what this talks about. Right. Can somebody in the class explain what this page talks about?
So uh, this is basically uh, tells us about the process, uh, how a uh, system would manage the users. Uh, it has like detailed description. This is the process of setting up users for rflone.com. And uh, there are like uh, different users here, super user, dealer, lender, and the, they have assigned like who would do what and uh, like uh, what are the, what would be the responsibility of each user. And uh, they are defining here, like uh, if like super user can manage users, manage dealers, loan calculator, submit credit application, while a dealer only could manage users and loan calculation and submit credit application, those. So, so, so Neeti, you talked about as in general, the whole document, right? Where mm -hmm. I'm interested in is, can you tell me exactly what the section 2.3.1 refers to it? What is the purpose of this thing in the document? Um, I, I took this document as an explanation and description of how the process should occur and uh, when is the process complete, such as uh, manage dealers, the agent should sign up the due dealers at artlon.com. When is it complete? The dealer uh, user shall be logged into artlon.com. What is their accessibility? And uh, the ID part I got out is, you know, they should, po they should get a unique franchisee number um, I think somewhere down, down it's, it's saying something about unique documents. Yes, um, that, you know, there should be two number for state, two number for county and three digits. Yeah. Right. So, so you are right on the spot, Shilu. What this essentially talks about is, as a business, they, there is a need to manage the dealers, right? So because they are the one who are going to submit the credit application. So this talks about how a dealership is managed in the system. So essentially talks about what essentially kicks off a process which is going to manage the dealer, right? So in this particular case, when an agent goes out and assigns a dealer a contract saying you can use this platform, this is what is what will kick off for them to go ahead and create an entry for a dealer workshop or dealer shop into the system. And the IDs and the business rules essentially governs what are the rules surrounding the creation of dealers, right? So for example, the first rule tells that, hey, as soon as I create a dealer, every dealer is gonna be associated with a unique franchise number, right? And somewhere later down in the document, it tells it what are the rules governing how the franchise number is gonna get created, right? Then it also talks about in the data sections at a high level, what kind of information is gonna be captured and, and whether it's gonna be create, read, update, or delete, right? So CRUD stands for create of creation of data, R means read of the data, use uh, signifies the data is gonna be updated as part of this process. And D uh, refers to that, hey, data is gonna be deleted or destroyed from the system as part of this process. So upon the commands that are written, those are the only thing you can do with that block, such as uh, dealer's name doesn't have D at the end, you can't delete it. Right, so it, what, what it tells me is when I read at this document and the way it's presented, at the time of the managing dealer workshop, the only thing I can do it is creation of a dealer information or I can access the dealer information if I'm in the process of updating it, and then I can update it. Uh, what it tells me is that removal of dealer data from the system is not permitted as part of this process. Okay. okay. Can you please explain source? And then you can see it as the same trend is continued for the section 232, 233, all the way up to 236. Now, Herschel, hold on to one minute here. So this is where I think it's, there was some discussion around manage user module, right? So in every system, you're gonna have some sort of user management functionality. And this 
table, which you're seeing right now on the screen, essentially tells you on the left-hand side, what are the different types of user in the system? And then when you go into different columns, it is telling you what functions each one of the user can access it. So in this scenario, by just by looking at it, I know, hey, as a super user, I can do everything but to approve or reject credit application, right? And if I'm a lender, the only function I can access into the system is approving it or uh, rejecting credit applications. Okay. So now when you see it, right, the manage users capability, earlier we were talking about the system admin, but in addition to system admin, the dealer is also able to create some type of users. So is area manager, regional manager, and RFI. The only person who cannot create any users is lender. Okay. So think about it, if, if I have to build a security around the system, this particular table will help me to make a determination who can access what type of functionality in the system. Any questions? No. All right, let's move forward, Herschel, then let's go to section 2.4, if there's no questions. Do you want to talk about here, or I think everybody probably understood the... Yeah, I think it's the same business rule. So unless they right. have a question, let's continue. Yep. Okay. Same thing, this one talks about managing the lender what kicks off, what happens after that process. Okay. Same thing for loan calculator. Anybody has any question on this process? Or it's pretty straightforward, I think, but since uh, they, they are new to this type of uh, requirements document, okay. So moving on. So here is an example. When you look into this one, um, there is a internal reference to other document. So this one talks about reference to a PDF file that was attached for as a credit application. So when you look into your physical copy at the end of the document, this is there or into the electronic copy right after the document, you have the this PDF. So this goes back to the three C part of the requirements, where is, do I have it a complete requirements with the internal reference? So if you don't have this PDF file, then that would be an example of a missing document or missing requirements and it's incomplete requirements. Let's continue. Okay. <laughs> Two, three, six. Yep. So this is the approval or rejection of credit application function. Okay. Now. Uh, the 2.4 is if there are any specific business rules which are governing at the project level, then those can be defined here. In this scenario, we don't have any external project rules that needs to be applied to this system. So that's why you see NA. Now, when you look into the next section, which is 2.5, this is where the security aspect comes in. So this is where it says, hey, which user can access what functionality in the system? And as part of that access, what kind of data operations they can do it? Can they create, read, update, delete type of things? 
now this will be a perfect example where uh, one other aspects of the three C is a consistency. So if you look into it here, you have pretty much the same information that was present into the section 232, which was manage user business process. So you need to validate it. Is the information same at the both the places? If, and if not, what should be the one as the correct information? And that's the question that you should be going back to your uh, business users or uh, project uh, managers. Now again here, yeah. right? right? They 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 are saying they can do the delete as well, but in the other section, they did not have access to delete anything. So that's that's just, that's where you need to have a discussion uh, with the business analyst or business and clarify: Are they should they be able to delete anything or not? Because that's important for your testing aspect and the quality assurance aspect to make it make sure it's a consistent. Uh, thing and which one is uh, correct uh, information. So, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, under the site administration. Um, you said that if if the information is correct and you're supposed to go back to the business analyst, um, when you go back to the business analyst to tell them that the information is incorrect, do you just communicate or is there a, a document that we need to provide? Well, uh, there are two ways to, you can look at it, right? You can ask the question in the right way so that you don't get uh, uh, some weird response. So you ask them for clarification. Uh, what should be the, instead of telling them it's uh, incorrect, um, the information is incorrect or something in, basically inconsistent. So you can ask them for clarification and then they can, it, it will let them think a little bit and say, come back. They, they might have to go back to the business and verify it from that, that side as well. Um, so it, it's a discussion with the business analyst at that point. Yeah, and Mega, a lot of times uh, the processes are not that formal, right? So you refer and say, hey, do I have to create a document of what all is inconsistent and send them a document? It's a lot of times it's just kind of, as Herschel men mentioned, it's kind of informal, uh, quick email to project manager who then may go to the their business users. Or sometimes they may hold a, let's go ahead and review the requirements document kind of sort of sessions. So you identify or raise that during those sessions. Yeah, generally com bigger companies, um, they have a review process. So they, there are formal reviews and informal reviews. Um, so you look at that, uh, so informal reviews or formal reviews that typically the team participates in there, team meaning the developers and the QA team. Uh, QQAs, folks, uh, business analyst writes this document, right? So you guys are not writing. You guys are the recipient of this document. So at once they have a kind of like a solid or solidify version, they might say, please review this and let me know if there are, there, are, there is any feedback or something. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a time you can say, yep, look, look, I need some more clarification. Maybe you can clear my doubt and uh, help me understand and that, that's where they can look at it and say, yeah, it looks like this information we need to validate with the business. And uh, so he or she will go back to the business and then update it and send you back again, the updated version at that point. Now in the agile world, right? So you are sitting there uh, with the customer along with the business analyst and the whole team, business analyst will write it but at, when, when it comes to the review, you can pinpoint or, you, or if you think the information is not correct, you can uh, discuss with them, hey, this is what I heard. Um, but business analysts say, no, this is what they confirmed afterwards or something like that. So it's a matter of clarification at that point from your standpoint, uh, what should be the correct information or what should be the, uh, your understanding, so. Okay. 
Let's move on to the next section. Sure. <clears throat> So any question on this particular diagram? Can you can anybody share with me what your understanding is when you read the document about this diagram? Like it's telling um, I think I can't who is hear responsible it. Responsible for each each user's responsible for you know, for example, like site administrator ha is responsible for managing three people. Um, and then dealers are, users are, has three different categories that they're dealing with. Yeah, so th this thing is kind of typically called, uh, like it's kind of sometimes referred as a use case diagram, which refers to as a user, what all functions I can perform it, right? So this is another way to depict the same information that you had it before. Yeah, but now, I think there is some arrows also missing, such as site administrator. It also at one point earlier said he can run a report, which is missing in this diagram. Precisely. So that's where the consistency comes in, right? So you should, as a quality assurance person, you should be able to identify these discrepancies and say, hey, the information is not consistent from one set of uh, information within a, a document to another side of the document. So this is where, just like what we talked about earlier, right? Where you have a delete functionality, which on one case, it says that you can delete it. Another scenario, they said you can delete it. So this is another inconsistency example. So you should be flagging those kind of thing as you read the requirements document to flag it and say, hey, we need to have a conversation which one is true? Can site administrator run the reports or they cannot? So then who will come with a final word on who can do what, which discrepancy has to be kicked out, which is to be kept and who's gonna correct this document? So typically as a quality assurance person, you, you will kind of raise this concerns. If you are like it's working in a traditional waterfall way, you will raise those to your project manager who in turn will communicate back with the users and get that clarification and share with you whatever the final answer is. In case of scenario like a, that Herschel talked about, if you're working in an agile environment, pretty much you're working together with the business user. So when you kind of raise this flag, the business user will be right there and they can provide that clarification to you. Okay. But the key point is, Without those clarifications, if you move forward in building the systems, then you don't know which um, scenario is gonna be right, right? So let's say if I kind of proceed further as a developer and I go ahead and implement a system where a site administrator does not have access to run the reports, and then you run a test scenario based on the information on the table up in this other part of the document, and then you fail it that, hey, you cannot run the report. So this now causes an issue is that you both are right, right? As a developer, hey, I'm right because I implemented what the document told me. And a quality assurance person says, hey, I'm right because I, I'm testing it based on what document tells me. So you run into scenario where now you build a functionality in the system that you are not sure whether it meets the user's intent or not. So everything has to match before it goes on. Ideally, you want to like it resolve all the issues before you go into the development cycle. And that's why it's an important that in the analysis phase itself, you as a quality assurance person, go through the system and perform that 3C and a T test to say, hey, is the requirement consistent? Do I have all the information needed for the requirement? And can I test it? And if answer is no to any one of them for any of the requirements in the document, then you raise the flag and says, hey, wait a minute, guy. Let's just make sure we all are on the same page. Let's just figure it out what exactly your intent as a user is from the system. Okay. 
and this is very common okay it's nice uh, every project you will go through this process the review process clarification process and no matter what who writes it nobody's perfect right even the business analysts uh, they are capturing it while they are capturing it they might misunderstand the business side of thing what they are trying to say so they might capture wrong information and uh, so forth as well so yeah, but but you hear something else, so you communicate, and that's where some discrepancy comes in, and it's just a matter of basically working with the business and clarifying, and then everybody moves on to their own tasks. You, you as a QA will work through the same same information, so that you can do the quality assurance artifacts. Developer will take a look at the same document, and they will start building out the system, designing it, and so forth. So shall we move on? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So now let's look at the section 2.6, right? So when you look at it, the section 2.3, it gave you a requirements from a business process point of view, right? Which talked about, hey, at what point this business process will get kicked off and what will happen after this process, business process is completed? And is there any specific business rules during that? Now the section 2.6 now gets into and says, hey, what additional requirements I have when I look at it functional view? Remember we had that diagram, the functional diagram? So for each of the functions, what are the requirements? And that's what this one lays out. So one of the leftmost function in that functional decomposing diagram was managing the dealer shops. So this talks about what are the specific business rules or the requirements you have to adhere when you're building the manage the dealer shop functionality. Okay. Now, some of these things may end up repeated from the process or a lot of these things will come as an additional support to that business process. So for example, when you look at requirement 1.3, it talks about, hey, this is exactly how the franchise number should be calculated in the system, right? It's gonna pick it up two digit state, followed by two digits of county, followed by the three digit number, right? So if I already have a dealer in Franklin County of Ohio, then the next time you create a new dealer, it will pick it up a number, which is the next sequential number, which in this case, it'll be 002 and so on. It also talks about what are the different functions that particular managed dealer shop module needs to have it. So uh, if I want to update a dealer, first I have to be able to find a dealer, right? So that's what required 1.1 specifies that, hey, I should be able to search dealer using certain criteria. Any questions on this one? And what are the unit priority category, just high and low? So typically um, when the business lays out, and this is the um, just remnant of the waterfall method, they will identify, hey, what are the high priorities requirements? What are the medium and which are the lower? So typically you always focus on uh, trying to get if you are running into a time constraint, you first focus on high priority. Then you focus on medium and then you focus on low priority requirements. Okay. In case of agile world, the higher priority essentially just says, hey, these are the requirements that I need to be implementing first. It's the same model, but one is focused within the bound of two weeks sprint versus in case of waterfall, it will be for the entire project. So uh, my, my question is what the business rule cross-reference signifies here? So if there are business rules which are dependent on each other, 
then that's where you will identify the cross-reference. Okay. And the same thing is on the left-hand column, which is a requirement source. Mm -hmm. It's typically like it's, if I've got the requirements from multiple sources, then it allows you to kind of identify, hey, who specified this requirement? So in the scenario where I have questions about that requirement, I know who provided that specification so I can go back to that person. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. The requirement 1.5 and 1.6, when you look at the business process in 2.3.1, um, that doesn't talk about notes or valid dates. Is is, uh, is that something that we're supposed to like compare like that it wasn't listed on the business processes that we need to point out to the so business it, analyst? It, it, so think of it, right? So it's not that everything must be laid out in the business process. Remember, as I say, this functional component requirements essentially augments to provide additional detail, or if there are anything that you missed it from the business process point of view. So there will be a scenario where you will have requirement, but if it's not clear to you, right? So in other words, is this correct? Does it belong here? You should have those kind of conversation if it's not clear, clear, clear to you, right? Okay. So in this scenario, right? So you put the requirement 1.5, uh, which talks about the system should validate the date of each reading to be a valid date. So in the scenario, right, you may have it, hey, when I create a new dealership, I might enter the data into the system, but it may not be valid from the date that I entered it. So for example, a lot of times you will hear it that, hey, yes, the contract has happened with certain entity, but that contract is effective from so-and-so date. So this one talks about it is that, hey, when you enter a date, the system should validate, is this a valid date, okay. right? So in other words, if I put a, let's say a system contract date that it's gonna be effective um, next month, then probably it's a valid date. But if I just say, hey, if the system, uh, if the contract is valid the 1st of December of 1900, then you should question it. Is this a valid date, okay. right? And if the clarity of what a valid date means is not clear to you, then that's a perfect example where you should ask question back to the business analyst or user and says, hey, can you tell me what the valid date means here? Does it mean everything in future or can I put a past dates also? Same thing, it's like with 1.6, they're talking it is that, hey, whenever my agent visits the dealer, I want them to have an ability to jot down the note of what happened in that visit, what was agreed or what discussion happened as a note into the system. That's good. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Let's get through it. Move on. So, Herschel, let's move on quickly. Uh, so, for all the subsequent Thank sections, you. we're going to stop only if you have a question. For any question for 2.6.2. All right, let's move to 263. Now I'm assuming it is, as you read through each one of these requirements, you kind of ran mentally that 3C and a T test to make sure, can I test it? And is this complete, consistent, and correct? Uh, sorry, uh, I have a question related to 6.2. Okay. So there is requirement 2.2 .2 when adding a dealer user type. So uh, what 
What are the use, dealer user type? So the question is, uh, if you think about it, right, under managed user, we say that there are different types of users. And mm -hmm. one of the type could be a dealer. So it's the person who is working at the dealership and accessing the system is nothing but a dealer user, right? Okay. So what, what all this requirement says is that, hey, whenever I'm trying to create a new user, and if that user is of type dealer user, I have to specify that user is associated with which dealership. Okay. So I can't just create a system in the system, a user, let's say called a Bob Smith of the type dealer user without saying that at which dealership they work on, mm -hmm. right? So I have to say, hey, if I'm creating a Bob Smith, I have to pick where does Bob Smith work in which dealership. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for 263 or 264? Right. Anything on 265? Go to 266. Hmm. Let's move to section 27. So this is more around reporting requirements. And the one about that uh, talks about, is there any additional what we call it is a non-functional requirement, which talks about, hey, do I need to build any training? Right? So whenever I build a new system, do I have to provide a training to my users or the system is gonna be self intuitive for any users to pick it up and start using it? Right? So in this case scenario, the description says that, hey, rflon.com, will provide their own training materials. So you as a system developer, don't have to create any training material for the system. Okay. The next section 2.7 talks about, hey, I'm gonna have multiple user types who can run the report. And it's gonna look a little bit different for each one of them, depending on who they are. And that's what it just provides the detail of what should look like for each one of them. And then section 2.8 talks about Appendix A. So now when you look at the section three, this entire section is dedicated to what we talked about as a non-functional requirement, or a lot of times known as elite type of requirements, which is what type of system availability, system auditability, system uh, reliability, all those things is gonna be defined in non-functional requirements. Okay. Any questions for any one of this requirements? Uh, if you could explain the scalability. So, Marshall, if you can go to scalability, right? So, what scalability requirement talks about is how the system should be able to handle the scalability of the number of users who will be accessing the system, right? So initially it talks about that, hey, when you roll it out, system should be able to handle about 500 users 
with a concurrency rate of 10%. That means at any given point, 50 users should be able to log in into the system and perform their function without seeing any degradation in the performance of the system. The next requirement says that, hey, that was at the start of the system, but over the next three years, I'm gonna see my user growth to grow to 150 person. That means it's gonna go from 500 to 1250, right? Because 150% of 500 is 750. And you add that to whatever the base number was, which was in this case, 500. And then when you consider 10% of that is 125. So it says that end of three years, the system should be able to handle 125 concurrent users without any degradation in the performance. Okay. So this goes back to the example that I was giving it for the Amazon, right? If it's coming a Black Friday, if everybody logs in, well, what is the system capability? What are the bounds of the system? How many users system should be able to handle it? So this gives a, a clear understanding for the development team and architecture team, what kind of physical machines and environments and the setup they need to build it in order to meet this requirement for the system. So the system concurrency rate uh, should be at least 10%. It could be more than that. Yeah. So it says that you need to design at least to handle at least 10% of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Think about an example, right? So if I've kind of put five different, uh, let's say, faucets in my house and I open all five of them, the question is, will I get the water at the same rate across all five, right? Same mindset, if I have five users accessing the system, is there enough resources to give enough for each one of the user to perform their function effectively? Okay. Any other questions on this section? Or shall we can scroll down? Let's go to the next section. What does redundancy talk about? Because it is a low priority. Right, so typically redundancy talks about, do I have duplicate environment, which acts as a redundant to this one? So for example, um, in, in this scenario, it says, hey, it's a low priority and there is no failover requirement. So let's say if I'm hosting it in a data center, uh, let's say, in New York and a tornado comes and hits that location and destroys that data center. In this scenario, there is no failover required. So essentially my system will be down till somebody fixes it, that data center, puts a new server, loads my application and gets it run. Okay. Another scenario would be is if there was a redundant requirement, even if the tornado comes and hits into that data center, I will have redundant environment somewhere, different geographic location, where all of my traffic can be diverted to that location and then it can be handled. So this is kind of very common in when you consider a critical applications. So things like um, 911 system, right? So people's life are dependent on that. So when you have to build a 911 systems, typically like there are a couple of layers of redundancy built into it. So that a one location failure or multiple uh, geographic area hit usually allows you to still continue to operate and still reach to the emergency services. Same thing goes with 
when you're doing a stock trading. Typically those run on a two to three different different end of payloads. But the downside of it is the more the redundant environment you have, the more infrastructure you need to build it. You need now multiple servers, multiple network connectivities going in. Also, you need to have the ability to figure it out whether a given node or a cluster is running or is it unavailable for whatever reason. Does that help? Yes. Now, one thing as a QA, right? When you look at this type of non-functional requirements, um, do you really have to test it? Um, so again, that depends on the company. Uh, some of the companies uh, have their specialized uh, teams, which can do certain type of uh, testing for the non-functional requirements. Um, uh, for example, uh, for the scalability, right? Scalability uh, requirement that we saw. Now you as a QA, you may not have to do, uh, in order to test this one, you need some specialized tools, uh, which is uh, we, which are offered by the company, which can simulate certain user loads and certain uh, measure the time and response and so forth. But you need, as a QA, you need to be aware of certain things and, um, yeah, but but as I said, I mean, there are specialized QAs to do the performance and load testing. Uh, similarly, there are specialized folks uh, who can do the redundancy and failover testing and uh, so forth as well. But most of the time, you as a QA, you will focus on the functional side of requirements uh, for when you are building out a brand new system and uh, so forth. Okay, so it's like kind of like a testing the features and the functionality of the system. Uh, initially, as you gain more, um, as you work on additional projects, gain more understanding of the uh, techni technical tools and so forth, you can certainly, I mean, do additional testing uh, from the scalability and redundancy and all kind of things. But it's question. good to understand all this terminology. Uh, question. It's just about the um, non-functionality testing. Um, you talked about tools that they use. Is, is the tool they use, is it automation tool? Um, not the automation tool. Automation tools are different. Um, okay. They are typically used for the functional testing, kind of like a what you do manually. You can do okay. manual testing, plus you can do automate, right? But there are specialized tools uh, here, uh, kind of like a J meter. Um, there is a load runner, wind runner, and so forth, which are used for the scalability testing. Uh, there are so many tools out there uh, for the scalability and uh, performance testing and so forth. But they are they are different tools. Um, okay. There is a specialized. You have to learn the scripting. Uh, you you have to configuration, uh, learn the, how to configure those tools and how to do a little bit scripting. For, for those uh, load testing tools. Okay, thank you. Sure. And there are certain non-performance requirements that you can still manually test it. Like, so for example, the redundancy one, right? You can manually test it. Like it's, you can create the two cluster and, and then you can start putting a request, make sure it goes to one sets of servers. And then you just turn off those sets of servers and still put the requirements and make sure it goes to the second set of servers. Right, yeah. Right. That's, yeah. that's the simplest way you can do it. But as Harshal mentioned, not necessarily all the non-functional requirements, you can do it manually. Some of them you may have to do the load uh, scripting through the various tools. And for some of that, you have to put some automation in place to do that. What is the tier application? Tier three application? Yes. Okay. okay. So there are standard terms in the industry for um, the recovery sets of rules when you can think about it, right? So 
depending on how critical the application it is, you assign them to a different tier. So for example, tier one, uh, it's usually one of the most critical applications. So when in the scenario where you have an actual outage because system unavailability, because let's say server crashed or um, sometimes you get a hardware failure. So it talks about is in the scenario where those kind of outages happen, how much within how much time you have to restore the application and functionality back to be online, right? So typically the lower the tier, the lower the time you have it to recover the application. So for example, tier one, typically it's expected you will bring back applications within two to three hours. Tier two application, usually you have up to eight hours to recover it. And, and tier three is typically like it's a week or so time frame that you have. It. So what it tells it is the lower the tier ranking is, you need to make sure that you have redundant or you have available hardware in place nearby so that you can swap it quickly. Okay. So, so is it basically uh, the lower the tier, the higher the risk? The lower the tier, higher is the criticality of the application, right? So let's say you may have a redundancy, like it's typically for 911 system, right? You have a redundancy. But even in the scenario, let's say a hard disk fails, right? And server goes offline and automatically fails over to the second server. But you still need to fix the hardware on the primary server quickly. Because in the event, if a tornado hits the second one, now all of a sudden you have no primary or secondary instance that you can route the request to. Okay, that makes sense. Typically that's what happens into banking applications, healthcare applications, or when you have 911 type of emergency services application. Same thing goes with the power management systems, right? If it's in a dead winter and tornado or ice storm hits and your data center is kind of knocked out that you cannot manage the power routing anymore, that's a critical. You want to like it's be that as a tier one so that I can swap within the matter of minutes, the whole hardware with the new hardware and then get back operational. Makes sense, thank you. Okay. Now, remember, like as I mentioned, everything comes with an expense, right? So in this, the example that we are working with it, right? The R flown. What's going to be harm if the application is not available for a day? Right? Probably that's not going to be that much harm. But if it's a 911 system and an application is out for an entire one day, think about how many lives it could cost. That makes a perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So let's go. Move to the next section. Same thing in terms of how long you keep the data, is the data retention, and what kind of disaster recovery you need to do that. Um, so I have one question. Mm -hmm. So what is the data retention? So typically by law, depending on which industry you are, there are certain requirements that you have to keep data for certain place. Like for example, if you're filing a tax return, right? Your requirement is you need to keep at last three years tax return handy, right? And typically they want at least seven years if you're running a business. That's kind of a data retention, how long you need to man retain the data. Same thing in the system. If I'm applying an application, let's say for a loan, all those record, per government rules has to maintain for at least two years. You cannot delete it before that. Okay. Now, the data retention requirements are important from the point of view that 
you need to understand that, hey, how many transactions I'm doing every day and how many days worth of transaction I need to keep it into the system, right? More the transactions and the longer you need to keep it, the bigger the storage you need it. Right, so to think about a scenario where, hey, you're taking 50 pictures a day and you're storing it on your computer and, and you keep it forever. Well, at some point you're gonna run out of the space on your computer, right? Right. At that point, you need to either figure it out where you can take this data and store it, or you need to delete some in order to save any more newer pictures now. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Same thing for data retention for systems. And so then there's talks about the communications and the standards compliance type of requirements. So this is all part of what will be the operating characteristics under which this system needs to work? Okay. And then sometimes if you have specific industry standards or government regulations, and if you got an exemptions, then you need to identify what exemptions are there because that maps to, hey, I'm not gonna fulfill this requirement and here's the reason why. So uh, QA should know the government regulations as well? So if the requirement says that, hey, system should be compliant to such and such government regulations, then you definitely need to be aware because you need to test it to make sure does the system meets that regulation. So for example, in the health industry, there is a regulation called HIPAA compliance, which mm -hmm. talks about how you're gonna prevent unauthorized access to the patient data, right? And if your requirement says that system should comply to HIPAA regulations, then you need to look into those regulations and say, hey, what are the requirements are applicable to this system from that regulation that I need to write the test cases and test the system against? Okay, thank you. Can you help me explain the standard exemptions again, please? Can you repeat the question, Tirth? Uh, can you help me understand the standards exemptions, please? Right, so certain scenario, right? Um, you may have, even though let's say you are kind of working in financial industry, let's take an example, right? So by default in financial industry, every record that pertains to a customer has to be retained for a certain period of time. But, uh, if that's determined that this is not gonna be the system of record, let's say, for example, if I wanna uh, create all the customer profile data, right? And that's kind of managed and maintained in other system. And all I'm doing in this system is kind of managing the temporary transactions, which at the end of the day will go into some other system for permanent record keeping, some sort of data warehousing then I might be exemption from this system to manage the data for that two years of retention period because that record is already stored somewhere else. Oh, Does yeah. that make sense, Tirth? Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next section. So that essentially completes the functional part of it from the requirements point of view. So now if you go into the design document, that's typically it provides it's much more detailed view from the point of view is that, hey, when they talk about the dealer data or dealer information, well, what are the specifics? Hang on now. Okay. So there, there is an appendix on the original document, right? Yep. Let me just go to the appendix A here. Right. 
So let's talk about the appendix for a moment before jumping into data um, design systems. So each of the appendix essentially provides an additional information that might have already been referred into the document, right? So appendix A talks about the business data and attributes. So at a high level, when you try to model the business data, what that's known is they, they kind of get into something known as an entities. Entities are nothing but a logical grouping of where the associated information are. So when you look at in this example, right, my entities are like dealer, the user, lender, and credit application. So all the information about the users or location where the dealership is located, the services that dealer provide, they are more or less kind of loosely coupled and grouped it with the dealer, right? So it tries to identify, hey, which are the key themes that manages the business data in the system? And those are called as entity. Now, if, if you try to get the entire data modeling class or there's a dedicated field around it is how to manage all this data, how to break it down, how to store it, how to structure it, and how to build the relationship between this data. Okay. In this one in appendix B, there is kind of some sort of high level relationship. What I'm anticipating is that as a quality assurance person, you will probably need to know what entities are in the high level, what relationships are, but you're not expected to model the data, right? There will be dedicated uh, database engineers or somebody within the development community who will be performing this detailed data mapping and data relationships. But for you, it's an important to understand how all these entities are related, right? And there is some description of how to read it. So for example, in this scenario, right? Um, the way I can read it is a dealer has zero or more users, right? So that translates to, hey, at a dealership, I'm gonna have zero or more people working at it. So initially when I create a dealer into the system and dealer has not created any employee who are working at that, there's no user associated with that. But once they start putting into the system all the employees who are working at that dealership who could submit the credit application, I'm gonna have one or more user associated with the same dealership. Okay. Same thing with the relationship between lenders and users, right? I may have one or more lenders. Yeah, we'll be covering this uh, data part a uh, little bit later. Uh, I believe it's uh, session number six or seven uh, sometime to get you a little bit more understanding of this uh, data entities and so forth. Okay. And then when you look into Appendix C, which is essentially what is sometimes your business analyst will provide is a mock-up screen or screen layout to give your mind around, hey, how is the information needs to be structured when it is presented to the user, right? So you can look into it as, hey, they're kind of given some guidance around high-level navigation of how they want the system to organize and present the information. Any question? What is CBC stands here? I mean, I can see CBC is used several times. Um, where are you looking at? Oh, it's uh, a callback log, Herschel. It's on the right hand side. It's a callback function or callback code. Okay. Um, I mean, 
uh, as a QA, uh, we don't need to know about it. Or like it's so uh, any times, any times you are not sure, you should ask questions. Okay. Right, and it it refers to hey, when I click on this information or in this button, well, what kind of data is going to be called and pulled it and displayed it. Okay. Thank you. Continue, Marshall. Here's the example of a sample PDF file. So it gives you what kind of information you need to collect it when you are submitting a credit application. Okay. Let's go. So that was the user point of view of a requirements document. Now, somebody has to take that requirements document and provide it enough detail so that the developers can start build a design from it, right? So uh, the way I would try to like it's related is, uh, if you recall, if we talked about building a house example, right, in the uh, first class. So if I may just say, as a user, I said, hey, I, I want a two-story house with four bedrooms and two bathrooms and a kitchen and a living room. Well, that's kind of at a high level as a user, what my requirements are. But that's not sufficient for a builder to essentially build a house, right? They need to tell it, hey, how big each of the room needs to be, what should be, how many windows that needs to be done, how many electrical outlet I need in each room. Those kind of details still needs to be provided for a builder to build a house, right? So that's where the system design document comes in, is, hey, I have provided you from the user point of view, what are feature and functions I wanted? Now, if I take that and convert it into a view that I need to give it to my developers who are gonna build the system, well, what kind of details I need? And that's what this document talks about. So as you read through this document, do you have any high level questions before we dive it a little bit section by section? If we can just go through the diagrams because they were a little intense for me. Okay. So let's go to the next section, first section, Harshal. Right, so this one is kind of should be very familiar. It talks about the product overview, same thing as a business problem. And then it starts talking about what are the characteristics um, that's gonna be applying it to the system when they build it, right? Um, so it talks about, hey, in which business segment or financial industry this is gonna follow. So is there any industry specific requirements that was not specified that I, we need to adhere to it? How many users, what are the operating characteristics needs to be the system? What are architectural constraints around it, right? So one of the things which was clearly laid it out in the requirements document that, hey, it needs to be built and accessible from Microsoft Azure platform. So that kind of restricts it that, hey, whatever the technology I use it, that better be compatible with that cloud platform. If it's not, then I can't build a solution using that technology. Okay. I had a question. Uh -huh. So uh, who do know that, uh, what's gonna be the growth every year? Okay, so in this case, it's kind of specified as 30%, right? So if you look at it, the other document said how many users growth over three years, right? It said 150%. This one is talking about annual growth rate of the users is only 30%. So that's the first discrepancy. So as you talked about or pointed out, right? This information doesn't match to what the information was in the document. 
So it'll be a perfect example where you should be asking question back to the project manager or your business liaison and says, hey, wait a minute, this set of information is different than the other one. Which one I should follow? Yep, that makes sense. And that's where the matter of consistency comes in. Yep. And uh, I think the third you were asking uh, also like who can provide this information. So that, that typically comes from the business. Uh, they will know, hey, uh, we are planning to sign up maybe let's, ta let's target for the first year, maybe 10 dealers and they will have X number of uh, users. So that's how they will come up with that. Or next three years, we'll, we'll get additional 100 dealers and how many number of users. So they, they will come up with run some calculation and come up with the growth. Uh, from that standpoint. So basically it's, it's just an estimate, right? It's estimated users, yes, that's correct, yep. Thank you. But the, the number should come from the business, that's the important part. Yeah, the, the one kind of thumb rule that I kind of follow is, if, if you are in the quality assurance field, you should never come up with a requirement yourself. It has to be provided by the user. And in the scenario, if user has not provided that detail, it needs to come from development team. But if there is a conflict between information provided by development team and your end user, then you should believe whatever your end user is telling you because they are the one who's writing the check for the system development. Okay, moving on. Now, some of the things in, which is provided on this page is around availability requirement. And typically like it's, uh, when you look at it, things like 99.98, 99, 98, 97, every incremental availability that you ask it. So when you think about 99.98% availability of the system, all you're saying is that throughout the year, you're gonna be down for less than five minutes. That's 99.98% availability, right? That you will be up out of thousand seconds, you will be up for 9,998 seconds for the system, that's what it meant, right? And in order to provide those kind of high level of availability, you need to build a redundant system and automatic failovers. So this essentially puts the bound for development team and the infrastructure team, which is building the uh, system, is what are the targets and the numbers that you need to achieve it in order to support the requirements from the business. And here is the detail for that tier one, two, and three that you were talking about. What is the recovery time? Is it like it's two hours, 24 hours, or one week? So there is a... So in this scenario, right, uh, part of the reason why this is kind of built in tier two is when you go into the Azure platform, by default, the minimum requirements that you get it is tier two requirements. Oh, okay. Because it's cloud, right? So that's why even though the business said it's, hey, I need a tier three, what we are saying is that because of the platform in which we have to be hosted, which provides a much higher availability, we'll just go with that higher availability. But we okay. are not charging business anything different than what we would have done with the tier three. Okay, thank you. Basically, uh the less of the tier, the higher the price. Is it, is it that what you mean? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go through it. It's 
basically need to see that end tier application in there. What's right. The so the hopefully you can relate that to what we talked about, right? So all it just says that, hey, what kind of application pattern I'm going to use it to build the system? Since it's in a cloud, it's by default, it supports multi tiered and above. So you're not going to build a monolithic app, it's going to be at least an end tier application. A lot of times you can refer N tier is same as a multi-tier. Okay. So this architecture driver, this section essentially refers to, specifically it's mainly for architecture team, but you need to know as a quality assurance person is what are the constraints. That's why we talked about the multiple different architectures, right? From a monolithic all the way to mobile architecture, right? And this one says, hey, in addition to those, is there any specific things that is kind of driving the way I'm going to build the application? So for example, one of the things that talks about, if you look into the second uh, entry here, that since my system is gonna be accessible through the internet and I'm gonna put a credit application information, right? Which requires your social security number, your income, some of your personal identification information like your birth date, your address, your name, those kind of things. You can just simply transmit that information over the internet in an un unencrypted manner because anybody could tap it and steal your data. Therefore, everything that the system does it has to be encrypted. And therefore, system has to use the SSL protocol whenever communicating information from a client machine to the server and back and forth. Encrypted means a special code. Encrypted means essentially it takes your information and applies some logic and makes it jumbled. So if somebody reads it, it didn't make any sense to them. Okay, but then certain people will be able to read that. So it is typically the way it works is that whenever you encrypt in an SSL format, there is a key stored on your local machine that essentially also has a similar key on the server. So when you send the data, you essentially encrypt it and send it over the wire. And the server, when it receives it, they, they take that information and apply the key to decrypt it and then decipher it. Okay, thank you. So hang on, Herschel, right here. So this diagram, does this refer a lot more similar to what diagram you had it as a context diagram into the requirements document? Yes. Right, it just drawn it a little bit different, but it contains exact same information. Right, it just shows different arrow and the interactions over the arrow, but you still have information between the dealer and system and lender in a system. The only thing additional here is the email notification. So previously we did not have them. It, it was just a notification, but as it drill down a little bit further, they say, oh, it's it can be email notification, maybe text notification, SMS, whatever. But here they are choosing the email notification will go out to the lender uh, on that front. Okay. This one essentially gives you a high level view 
of how the different components are located at the user side versus the server side and how the communication happens. Yeah, re remember this is a technical document, uh, the design document, right? So it, uh, it has a lot of technical aspect, how the user will be accessing what type of protocol, whether it's gonna be over the wire and your internet and so forth. So it's a different audience for this document, but as a QA, you still need to be able to understand a little bit further um, so that you can, it, it will help you for testing perspective. This one talks about how the security is going to be implemented in the system, right? So there are multiple ways. One of the ways is Active Directory, where essentially, like, it's user has an account and associated credentials, as well as like it's, or you can just do it simple user ID and a password mechanism. So if you're working in any of the corporate world you will see that your accounts are usually tied with some sort of directory where you have multiple credential or multiple people are accessing to that directory to pull the information. But if you are in a kind of a retail system where if I'm just a user and logging into, let's say Amazon's website to provide that, all I have it is my user ID and a password. And so they are talking about that the mode of authentication will be used in the system is simply user ID and a password. Then if you go into the process and it talks about, hey, if I'm running some sort of processes in the background, what kind of uh, role they will play it and what information and business function it does. So one thing Herschel talked about, hey, there's gonna be an email notification. All that requires is I have an email process running in the background and whenever I need to send a notification, I just kind of hand over that information to that process and they will send the email. Same thing with the database, right? Whenever I need to enter any information into database, I'll interact with that database process and then let the database process store the information for me. Now here it's again the security, who can access what kind of role. And then for each of the role, what kind of access is tied to it. Herschel, hang on for one minute. So uh, in here, right after encryption, you have a non-repudiation requirement. So essentially what it tells it that I cannot create duplicate of things. Everything has to be tracked with the ID and the timestamp. So that way every transaction is recorded as a unique transaction instead of creating a duplicate entry for the same thing over and over again. So this thing also happens a lot of times if you're submitting something for, let's say, uh, if I want to do it, some withdrawal from a bank, right? As soon as I click a withdrawal, it, it grabs the timestamp and makes sure that I do it. So even if I can do the same amount of withdrawal time over time, every transaction is identified as a unique transaction. So they can go back and track it and prove it each unique transaction. And here are some of the recovery requirements, which ties back to the requirements that are specified in the non-functional area. Okay. Let's go to the context diagram. So I believe one of you had mentioned it, that you have some questions around the diagrams. So what kind of question you have it around this diagram? Okay. 
No, I'm fine. Okay, so it looks like it's fairly clear, right, for everybody. It just refers to what information goes into the system and what information is produced from the system as output. Okay, let's go to that. And so then there is a functional decomposition diagram. This is nothing but a view of how actually the system is gonna be implemented. So in this case scenario, you can see it, there are a little bit different functions than what was logically defined into the other document. Here, we are implementing a module called Security Manager, which essentially it's gonna manage multiple functionality like managing the users as well as authentication is each users and making sure they have access to the right information. So this is an implementation view of how the functionality is broken down. Okay, and for each component there are capabilities of, hey, what each of the modules is gonna do it. So when you look into the previous one, you had about seven or eight modules that was defined for that. When you go into the implementation, you have only about five. And then the big section is around the logical data model. So if you go into um, the next section, Herschel, remember like it's there was a skeleton thing which was defined into the Appendix A about the entities. This essentially further provides some more detail around that. And then if you go to the next section, then what it does is it takes each one of the entity and breaks it down as what information is associated with each one of them, what is the relationship, and when you drill it down for every entity, then what kind of information, whether it's a required, what type of data type is, all those things is defined. So if you go back down in the user's entity, right? So it says that, hey, every user is associated with the user ID, which is unique. And by the way, it's a system generated a number. And whenever you say that, hey, I'm trying to create a user or access a user, that information is always present. So if you think about it, a lot of times when you're filling out some forms, they always say, hey, this is a required information versus this is optional information. That's what this table provides that detail. That for every entity that you created it, what is the required information and what is the optional information? And then you may have a different data type, right? So for example, ID is typically tends to be a number versus your user type um, that could be a text, right? It could be a dealer user or a lender user or RFREP user type of things. Same thing with people's name, tends to be a text, right? Versus if I go ahead and put a social security number, then that's typically a number, but it's a nine digit number, right? So a lot of times it may be represented as a text number. So I have one question. Yes. Uh, so is data collector? Say that again, you were cut off, Nikita. Uh, entities are the data collector? Not data collector. Entities are, if you think about it, is a grouping of closely related information. As Herschel mentioned, when we go into uh, about sections, uh, session six or seven, we will go into a lot more detail around what entities are and what database and have the information are kind of organized. But you can think about it as if you have, let's say if you have an Amazon account, right? Yeah. You will have a profile, a user profile. And that user profile may have multiple information about what is the email address? What is the user ID? Uh, what are the payment methods associated with it? What are billing address? What are shipping address? When you think about it, all of those things is nothing but in all the information related to a customer. Okay. Right. Same way in this scenario, if I'm just saying a dealer user, 
Well, what all information I needed for dealer user? Most likely I need a first name, last name. I need a password. I needed which dealership I'm associated with it. I may also have um, street address where I'm kind of working it or dealership address. So all those kind of information which is collected and grouped together is an entity. And then as you can see, this document talks it in length about the user, then it talks about the dealers, lenders, and then also provides the level of detail information you needed for credit applications. Any questions on the table or at least high level of what information trying to capture it, what data type means, whether it's a required or non-required field? All right, so let's go to the integration concerns. So the integration concerns essentially talks about if this system integrates with the external systems, have they integrated and what kind of information they pass back and forth. So in this particular example, for our flow, the only external dependency was identified was the email system. So this one talks about, hey, if I'm kind of in a communicating with the email system, what information goes into the email system? and what information comes from the email system into the R flow. And, and prominent thing that comes back and forth from the email system in the requirement segment that was defined is more notification only, right? So that's where you see it as all the notification that comes back and forth from the system. And it talks about the uh, application architecture, which is end here, that you read it earlier in the document. And here it's kind of like it's how that structure is defined. So if you look into it, I have a presentation tier and underneath that I have a business tier and the data tier is kind of broken down into data access logic and the actual data store, similar to what we had it in the multi-tier uh, application architecture. Okay. Actually, we can get to the next one. So now this diagram is one of the key thing. This gives you a view of how the different pages in the application is gonna be laid out. And from one page, what event triggers you to go into the other page. So for example, if you look into uh, at the top, right? If I'm a dealer user and I log in, that by default takes me to my homepage called dealer homepage. And from there, I can either calculate the loan or I can submit the credit application, or I can check on a given loan status, whether it was approved or not. Same thing from the site administrator point of view. If I log in as site administrator, I can land into administrator homepage and from there, I can perform different functions. Okay. So you will see it this kind of different laid out. Now in this scenario, it's not completely complete diagram because as you can notice it, like it has only like three user type of information showed. It doesn't show at what happens at when I log in as a area manager or our flow and rep, what kind of screen I get it. But you get the gist that they may provide it for key users, what the overall flow of the application is gonna look like. Okay, any questions on this diagram?
If not, let's move to the next section, which essentially kind of refers all the supporting information. If there are things which was abbreviated anywhere in the documentation, it just gives you, well, what does it mean? So like, for example, you talked about CBC or if it's SSN, well, it refers to social security number and so on. Okay, so that covers both the document. Let's open the floor to see if you have any specific questions that you still have it. Okay. All right, so if you don't have any question, here's what I would recommend. As I mentioned earlier, right? Um, every time you will read a document, you will like it's kind of uncover more information that you didn't notice it when you read it, the document the first time. So what I would recommend is between now and uh, we'll use a little bit on Saturday, but we'll definitely use these documents on Sunday. So between now and Sunday morning, I would strongly recommend all of you to read this document at least once more and try to get a little bit more insight into, hey, can I have a 3C and T test for every requirement that was specified in the document? If not, what kind of information I may need it in order to say, yes, I understood the requirement and it is complete for me and I can test it. I would kind of start writing it down all those questions so that when we get into Saturday and Sunday on those discussions, we can talk about that. Sure. Okay, now one more thing, you won't need a laptop on this Saturday. Okay. But we will most likely you will need it on Sunday to type in things. Any other questions before we wrap it up for the day? So this is the standard format that every company follows? I, I, would, I would put it a little bit differently. I would not say that this is the standard format, but this is okay. the standard set of information that every company will look into the requirements document. Got it. Thank you. They may present it in a different format. They may have a different template, but okay. the gist is you're gonna have all the functional requirement. You have gonna be all the non-functional requirements. You may have a whole bunch of diagrams like such as context diagram, use case diagram to convey the information of what the user is wanting. Okay. If there are no other questions, Herschel, if you have anything to add it, if not, we can call it an evening. Yeah, I think uh, as Dilip said, I mean, read the document, try to get a big picture of the features and functionality that needs to be built. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that would be the good starting point uh, before we jump into the actual um, testing artifacts on Saturday, actually Sunday. So make sure you read it at least one more time uh, before that, both documents. And we'll see you guys on uh, Saturday. Please try to be there by 8.45 yeah. so we can start sharp at nine o'clock. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we'll start regardless, nine o'clock. I mean, uh, and uh, yep, uh, all th those who are attending online, uh, just uh, be try to be there uh, five to 10 minutes before. Uh, try to log in and I think you guys should be all right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. See you, Thank you so much. Saturday. Sure. All right. Have a good evening. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.